Good afternoon, His Excellency Ambassador Gittenstein, His Excellency Ambassador Lambronidis, Mayor Defau, Rector Mogherini, Vice Rector Oshneska Tameska, professors and visiting professors, MATA students and alumni, College of Europe students and staff, and our dear guests. Today we're celebrating the five year anniversary of the Master of Arts in Transatlantic Affairs, MATA. This program was the brainchild of College of Europe Rector Jörg Monar and Fletcher Dean James DeVridis with the objective of educating the next generation of transatlantic leaders. The transatlantic relationship would go through many challenges during these five years, including multiple crises related to health, the economy, and security. The, professor began, the program began under the leadership of Professor Simon Schunz and has flourished thanks largely to the teamwork that included outstanding academic assistants and secretaries. So I'd like to recognize Brice Didier, Jana Brovedi, and Juliette Dupont, and our secretaries Annalise Deckmann and Belinda Durikara, and working with our Fletcher colleagues, in particular Dean Lori Hurley and MATA Academic Director Chris Miller. The MATA program ensured that as students develop the needed expertise to understand the transatlantic relationships challenges and the critical benefits that it provides. Our students have had access to the world-class academic programs of the College of Europe and the Fletcher School, including joint courses bridging the three campuses in Bruges, Natalin, and Medford. They've had interactions with policymakers, including previous U.S. ambassadors to the EU and previous EU ambassadors to the U.S., through their internships, they gain practical experience in international institutions like the United Nations, NATO, and the European Union. They hone their research skills at think tanks like Brookings, the Atlantic Council, and the Bertelsmann Foundation. Some pursued advocacy in their internships through institutions like the Clean Air Task Force, while others went into the private sector for firms like Roche Pharmaceuticals. And this diversity of practical experience they gain during their time as MATA students is reflected in the diverse career paths that they've taken since. MATA grads now work in diplomacy, research, government administration, nonprofits, and private industry. And they have the privileged status of being alumni of two truly formidable global alumni networks. We'd like to thank those individuals and organizations that have supported the work of MATA and enabled our students to attain these remarkable achievements. The Fulbright Commission, Squire Patton Boggs, ExxonMobil, Microsoft, and Procter & Gamble have helped with scholarships for selected students. The Jan Olaf Hausarter Thesis Prize has recognized the excellence in research achieved by MATA students who have to satisfy not only one thesis supervisor, but two, one on each side of the Atlantic. We also thank the U.S. mission for organizing so many events and visits that the MATA students have participated in. And we also thank the organizations that have given their time and expertise in welcoming our students in their study trip and other visits, including the European External Action Service, the Canadian Mission, AmCham, and the Council Working Party on Transatlantic Affairs. We greatly appreciate their generosity with their time and knowledge. This year's Amelia Earhart promotion has benefited from a thriving MATA community with students on both College of Europe campuses in Bruges and Natalin and at the Fletcher School. And the Earhart promotion is currently planning for their second year on the other side of the Atlantic during a period of particular significance for transatlantic relations. Indeed, over the past few months, the cooperation between Europe and the U.S. has proven itself to be indispensable to international stability and economic prosperity. The significance of this relationship was well known to Madeleine Albright, to whom this event is dedicated. I know that others who knew her personally will be saying some words on her legacy during today's event, so I would like to limit my remarks to recall a quote from an interview that she did with the New York Times in 2020. When she was asked if you were able to assemble an Avenger-style dream team to come in and fix the world right now, who would be on that team? And her reply was, well, it would certainly be a female team. <laughs> and looking at the leadership of the College of Europe Bruges and Natalin campuses and the Fletcher School, we obviously take her advice very seriously. And I know that our female leader, leaders of the MATA partners share the vision of its founders on the importance of a program like MATA to cope with the challenges facing us today. Whether the issue is international security, climate change, energy, trade, 
financial regulation, or technology, no durable solution can be achieved without transatlantic cooperation. This relationship is indispensable. I invite everyone today to enjoy the celebration of the first five years of MATA dedicated to the legacy of Madeleine Albright. And in particular, I address our students and alumni without whom MATA would not exist. This celebration is about you and your achievements, and above all, we honor you today. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Mayor of Bruges, Dirk de Fau. Mr. Ambassador Giedenstein, Mrs. Rector Mogherini, dear professors, uh, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, I want to congratulate the College of Europe with the five-year anniversary of the Master of Arts in Transatlantic Affairs program. The city of Bruges is very proud of the presence of the College of Europe in our city. Since 1949, the college has been a symbol of union and cooperation between different countries. Students who enroll in the college are prepared to achieve great things within Europe. Many people count on them to find solutions to the external and internal challenges within the European Union. The Master of Arts in Transatlantic Affairs program prepares students to strengthen the ties between the European Union and the United States. It is aimed at cooperation between the two continents in different areas such as climate, change, trade, and financial stability. And it is precisely in this way, through collegial cooperation, that we can achieve the best results. Tackling major challenges together ensures that we can solve those challenges in the most efficient way. I wish everyone associated with this program good luck with everything they want to achieve. And as mayor of Bruges, I am proud that the seed of transatlantic relations is being, being planted in our city. On, I should say we will drink uh, next uh, few hours on the 10 year anniversary of this program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mayor Defau. I'd like to now um, present Rector Megar uh, Federico Mogherini. Thank you, Michelle, uh, Professor Chang, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Ambassador, uh, professors, uh, uh, students, colleagues, uh, friends, uh, not only uh, in this room, but also connected uh, uh, with us uh, from uh, our campus in Natalin, Madame Bruce Rector, I'm going to give you the floor in a minute, and also our colleagues and friends uh, uh, from Washington DC as we are also connected with the EU delegation to the United States. Uh, let me say how proud and even uh, emotional I am today um, for this celebration. Um, it is uh, for me uh, something quite special to be here standing with my three flags, if I can say so, because I feel the American flag very much as my own flag, as one of my, uh, I would say, life-changing experiences was uh, um, a German Marshall Fund fellowship that allowed me to spend one entire month uh, in the United States to get to understand the profound identity of the states beyond the West Coast and the East Coast. And I think that uh, the same kind of experience somehow uh, can be reflected in what we do in, uh, in MATA. Uh, obviously, we study much more than I was doing that back then, uh, but um, not only from an academic point of view, but also from a point of view of living Europe and the United States. Uh, the transatlantic program that we're celebrating today, its fifth anniversary, is somehow bridging the Atlantic and trying to develop a common community of young leaders that uh, across the Atlantic can shape the future of transatlantic relations and can deepen the understanding of Europe in the United States and of the United States in Europe. And I think this is really something precious. Uh, probably you hardly find a moment in history where you would not say that the transatlantic relations are um, at a crossroads or particularly relevant or vital in that particular historic moment. But I think that today, in these months, we are really seeing this for real. 
Imagine the war in Ukraine without the European Union or without the transatlantic relations established through NATO, how the Russian aggression in Ukraine would have impacted Europe or our societies, our communities. Um, it would be a completely different scale. It would probably turn into something similar to the Second World War or the First World War uh, more than one century ago. So this to say that probably today we are measuring and, and touching even stronger than before how important it is not only to be on the same side, to work hand in hand, uh, but also to have younger generations aware of not only the relevance of this partnership and this relationship, but also knowledgeable about how to shape it for the present and the future. And I think this is why, at least for me, uh, it is so important uh, to nourish our uh, MATA program uh, to uh, maybe be able to celebrate the 10th anniversary five years from now with many more students, with many more scholarships, with many more uh, uh, human resources, and uh, uh, for sure with the same level of political attention and support both from uh, the uh, US mission and from the EU delegation in, uh, uh, in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, let me uh, say one word about... Uh, uh, the, the, the person, the friend for me uh, to which we dedicate this uh, uh, ceremony today uh, and the academic year uh, for our MATA program, uh, who's Madeleine Albright. Um, I, um, I now risk to turn even more emotional because uh, uh, if you ask me, uh, uh, and some students have asked me uh, in some of our meetings and, and talks, uh, uh, who uh, has been my mentor, I would probably uh, say Madeleine Albright. <laughs> Uh, I will perfectly remember all my life, the very first time I met her, I just became a foreign minister of Italy, relatively young, I was 41. Um, in Italy, the thing was uh, quite controversial, too young, a woman, uh, too young woman. And, um, and I, one of my first visits, obviously, uh, was uh, to Washington DC, also because in Italy you grow up uh, knowing that there are two pillars of foreign policy, the European Union and the United States. So, you go there. And uh, I was uh, uh, honored to have a dinner in my honor at the residence, beautiful residence of the Italian ambassador to Washington DC, Villa Firenze. And sitting next to me at my right was Madeleine Albright. And for me, she was Madame Secretary. <laughs> uh, I was very impressed by this. And um, she told me, Federica, for me, it was really very important to be here tonight. And we didn't know each other. Because we, you know, I, I want us to be friends with me, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I would be honored to. And she said, yes, because you know, I made time, I wanted really to come and, and meet you because I know how you feel. You're young, you're a woman, I've been there, it's tough. It's not you, it has been tough for me too. And then something clicked in my head and I thought, okay, if it has been tough for her and she is a giant, okay. It's okay, it's okay, I can deal with that. And from that moment onwards, I will always have kept in my mind this, this word that she told me. You know, uh, maybe it's an anecdote that is very well known in the United States. For me, it's state, and maybe the students have heard me saying this hundreds of times already. Um, she told me a couple of uh, weeks after I started as, uh, as a secretary, um, colleagues and friends were telling me, Madwen, you're gaining weight. And I was replying to them, no, it's my, thin, it's my skin that is getting thicker. And I always thought of this that she told me, in the beginning, it's tough, and you need to get tough. And only after you've established yourself, then you can allow yourself to get soft again and be yourself. Because at that time, you have established your, 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 your position. And it's a process you have to go through. You can make it. I did it. It was tough on me, too. And this experience that she has shared with me has always accompanied me in the difficult moments of, that I faced afterwards. Uh, now it's much easier, but still, I think that any woman in, uh, um, in leadership positions, and I guess also some men sometimes, face tough moments. And these words that she shared with me and this friendship she has always uh, shared with me um, have accompanied me in, uh, in, in all the steps of my career. And her dedication to, to empowering women 
uh, all over the world has always been impressive to me, her courage. Uh, the la very last things we've, we've done together has been with the Atlantic Council, trying to put together advices for the Biden administration on Afghanistan. I'm afraid they were not properly really followed, but, uh, but we, were, we were both uh, uh, very determined to, to, to try and put together something that could have empowered women in Afghanistan. Uh, to, uh, to, to, to strive and, and uh, uh, lead their country somewhere else. But uh, this to say, uh, this was a uh, um, few months um, before she died, and uh, the energy and the courage, the determination she was putting in all these meetings was still remarkable and amazing. And I think that this is a lesson for us all. When you believe in something, you, you know that something is right. Um, you, you really put everything that you have, all your energy in that. And I think this is a great lesson for our students too. Uh, do what you think is right, uh, uh, even when you feel that uh, this is going against the wind. Uh, and sometimes you change the wind and then the wind follows. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is an incredible uh, figure that uh, uh, has inspired and can inspire so many of us and that honored us in the College of Europe uh, as uh, an American European and a European American uh, visiting uh, our um, campus in Natalin uh, and uh, uh, being there uh, a few years ago. And I know that our vice rector, Eva, will share with us uh, not only a few words on uh, uh, the relevance of the MATA program and our uh, fifth anniversary of it, but also uh, some memories about Madeleine's visit uh, to Natalin campus. Eva? You have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Rector, dear ambassadors, distinguished guests, professors, dear students. It is an honor to be with you today to commemorate and uh, reminisce Madeleine um, Albright, um, a true proponent of freedom. She was a real American stateswoman and the first woman to become the US Secretary of State. Madeleine Albright was born, as we know, in Czechoslovakia, in a diplomatic family. It was one of the reasons why she understood Europe so profoundly and advocated the Central European aspirations to become NATO members after the Cold War. As Ronald Asmus once said, her intellectual paradigm was shaped by Munich, Munich 1938. I would like to start today's intervention by showing you a short video about her last visit at the College of Europe in Natalin in 2019, as uh, Rector uh, mentioned before. In the United States, we have a slogan that has been drilled into us in relation to the fight against terror. If we see something, such as unattended suitcase or a backpack, we should say something. Well, when I look around the world today, I am disturbed by much of what I see. So I've added a third element to the slogan, see something, say something, and what I've added is do something. And that is why I'm calling on people on both sides of the Atlantic to stand together and vow that we will not allow would-be dictators and despots to shape our future. Listening to Madame Secretary is even more meaningful in the context of what we are witnessing now, as Rector said, with the Russian aggression in Ukraine. The war is taking place just across the UN and uh, NATO borders. Now, um, we are all facing firsthand the importance of the transatlantic uh, cooperation. The focus on security now aims 
to deter the threats from the East. Just a few days ago, Finland and Sweden have formally requested uh, to join the Transatlantic Alliance after decades of neutrality. And here, we have to recall and uh, underline Madeleine Albright's contribution to NATO enlargement in the 90s, after the Cold War. Obviously, uh, the preparations to the expansion started during the first Clinton cabinet. But when Albright took over as a Secretary of State in 1997, she exp exp expedited the process and crowned uh, the work. Her nomination was perceived by many as a proof of an American determination to support the transatlantic aspirations of the countries previously locked behind the Iron Curtain. Madeleine Albright became an advocate for NATO enlargement right away. She fostered this policy to European allies, the American public, and the US Senate were hesitant or even skeptical sentiment prevailed at first. As an excellent negotiator, she was able to persuade the Republican and Democratic senators to support this historic <coughs> vision. In March 1997, the NATO Enlargement Ratification Office, so-called NERO, was established. NERO's goal was difficult, getting the constitutionally required two-thirds of the senators present to approve the enlargement. Albright was presiding over the process. Thanks to the hard work and appropriate coordination, on 30 April 1998, the Senate approved the expansion by a vote of 80 to 19. It was Madam Secretary's great success. It paved the way for Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic to sign the NATO Treaty on 12th of March 1999 in Independence, Missouri, and to re-establish the security structure of Europe for years to come. I am today in the Jan Karski room at Natalin premises. It was a symbolic place also for Madeleine Albright. Karski was an envoy of the Polish government in exile to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt during the Second World War. After the war, he stayed in the US and Professor Karski after was also Albright's academic mentor. Upon his retirement, she took the chair at the Georgetown University. What is more, her last interview here at the college in Poland took place in this very room. During my last talk with her, Albright also recalled her other mentor, this time in politics, Zbigniew Brzeziński, the former United States National Security Advisor. He invited her to cooperate as a staff member on the National Security Council. Today, his son, Mark Brzeziński, serves as the US ambassador to Poland.
let me also say that Madeleine Albright was important for me. The meetings with her have enriched my perception of professional mission. She knew how to listen and advise. Although Albright functioned in the world of real politics, she was able to hold on to values and she was always supportive of other women. It's true what the rector said some minutes ago. She was very supportive of other women. As you may know, Madame Albright paid great attention to detail. The things she wore and the symbolism behind them became a real trademark. I am talking a lot about NATO today, NATO today, and let me show you one picture. This is a photo from 2016 when she visited Napoli for the first time. On that day, the NATO summit uh, took place in Warsaw. Do you know what this V on her jacket means? As she said, it is the Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty, a safe future. Her ability to reflect was always admirable. President Joe Biden, in his eulogy, deliberate at Madeleine Albright's funeral at the Washington National Cathedral, said that politics, especially international, is personal. These words greatly summarize Albright's legacy. Her successes came from, from her strength, wisdom, character, and other personal qualities. Central and Eastern Europeans, I am one of them, are grateful to Madeleine Albright for her efforts and commitment that contributed to NATO enlargement. Indeed, it was a historic process. Madame Secretary's participation was political, symbolic and emotional because of obvious reasons. She has changed the history for the better. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Rector. Thank you, Eva. Uh, I think we all uh, somehow owe Madeleine this uh, Madam way of calling us, because uh, somehow she started it. Uh, also, addressing one of the key questions of women in leadership, how should I call you, is one thing that we're always asked at a certain moment. <laughs> and she defined it, Madam, Madam Rector, Madam Vice Rector, Madam Secretary, Madam Minister. Um, it, it didn't work for me because Madam High Representative and Vice President was definitely too long, but anyway. Uh, thank you very much, Eva, for having shared with us uh, uh, these memories, uh, this video, these images, the symbolism of the Article 5. I'm curious about knowing about your pin, because I think you have a pin there, so I'm sure it has a meaning. But thank you also uh, to, um, to bring uh, to, to, to your contribution that has brought to us uh, the perspective of um, uh, how uh, Madeleine's uh, work and uh, stubbornness also and courage uh, was determining uh, for the entire continent uh, of, uh, uh, of Europe, uh, and not only uh, Europe also, far beyond that. Uh, now, um, let me uh, move on to the next step of our uh, celebration of our fifth anniversary of uh, the MATA program, uh, and um, uh, move probably from uh, the memories of uh, the legacy of a great woman uh, to um, an introduction on what would come next in the uh, EU-US relations. 
uh, that is something that our students in Malta study in principle every day uh, and night. Uh, and uh, um, let me tell you that I'm very honoured uh, that we have uh, here today with us uh, remotely uh, the head of the EU delegation in Washington DC, Stavros Landrinidis. Uh, and um, I say most importantly, only because I know Stavros for many years and I know that he will forgive me for saying this, but let me say most importantly, the relatively newly appointed um, ambassador of the United States um, uh, to the European Union. Um, and I think it is an excellent opportunity for us all uh, to uh, get a grasp of how the state of play of relations is, but also the perspective uh, in a time where probably the sector of security cooperation is growing much bigger than expected on both sides. And um, staying together and working together is even more important than ever. So, Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for joining us, and the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Rector. Ambassador, Vice Rector, College of Europe faculty and staff, distinguished guests and esteemed students. Before I begin my address, I think my PD staff is their throat is in their heart is in their throat, but I'm going to depart a little bit from it because uh, although I did not know Madeleine Albright, I met her a few times. She was an icon to me as well, um, and I'll tell you why. Um, I was asked to become an ambassador first to Romania uh, in 2009. I'd have been a lawyer, like the mayor, uh, and I'd never thought about being an ambassador until the, president, the vice president of the United States at the time, Joe Biden, asked me to do it, and I was worried about did I have the skills to do it, et cetera. I was not a so-called foreign policy maven, the archetype of which was Madeleine Albright. Uh, and I wondered you know, how to do the job, how to talk like a diplomat. Some people say, I don't talk like a diplomat. I'm a little too blunt. Mm -hmm. But you know what I learned about Madeleine Albright and what I always admired about her is she was sort of the essential diplomat, but she didn't talk like a diplomat. When I, and I was in conversations on sort of at the periphery watching her, and she was very blunt, and I like that in a diplomat, and I think it's important. I'll give you two stories about her one of which I know is true, because I was with the, pers the person who told me this story, actually, Madeleine Albright said this to her, to him, and the other is, I've read about and I assume is true. The first story comes from Senator Chris Dodd, who some of you may know, who was a very well-known member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, a very close friend of the current President of the United States, and quite a good diplomat in his own right. And I was having dinner with him. My wife, Libby, is in the audience. She may remember this. And it was in the middle of some Middle East crisis. I can't remember which one. Probably towards the end of the Clinton administration. And um, he had called her about how to deal with it. And she, she had sort of lost patience with him, it was clear, about his, you know, which was unlike Chris to be so cautious. And uh, Madeleine Albright said to him, Chris? When doing diplomacy in the Middle East, it's like riding a bicycle. Just keep on pedaling, which was a very blunt and pragmatic way of looking at the Middle East, and it's obviously true. Uh, and the other story, which is a well-known apo story, apocryphal, I would imagine, but I could also see her doing this. This is, I think, in the Clinton administration. I think Colin Powell was still chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, she may have been at the UN at the time, and there was a struggle over what to do uh, about Serbia and the, Baltics, or the, the Balkans. And uh, she was in a meeting with President Clinton, Colin Powell, and Colin Powell was bragging about what his military could do or what, what and what it couldn't do. And, and she turns to him in front of the president and says, well, I'm very impressed with your, your military, but when are we going to use it? When are we going to use this wonderful military? Which was a very blunt way of confronting, a, you know, an, incre an incredible general and a chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Uh, I admired her a lot. Uh, I try to think of her sometimes when I have to be very blunt with people. And as as uh, the rector knows, sometimes you have to be very blunt with people, and it's not very diplomatic. But let me move on to what I wanted to talk about today. Beyond that, it is a pleasure 
for me to join you today for the fifth year anniversary of the Master of Arts in Transatlantic Affairs program. Given the events in the current global climate, I am not sure there has ever been a more important time to be studying transatlantic affairs. Nearly one year ago, President Biden traveled to Brussels to meet with Presidents von der Leyen and Michel for the US-EU summit, the results of which was an ambitious roadmap to shape the course of the transatlantic relationship for the years ahead. So much has changed since that historic meeting. However, one, of the, one thing remains very clear. The United States and the European Union are more united than ever in our commitment to ensuring democracy and free markets and that triumph over autocracy in Europe and throughout the world. During my time as U.S. Ambassador to Romania, I came to realize that the, Euro the European Union is the most important organization in the world for bringing democracy and the rule of law to countries like Romania and the rest of Europe. It was for this reason when the president asked, the president-elect asked in November of last, uh, in November of 20, what I wanted to do, that I said I wanted to be a part of that process in Brussels. He was sort of surprised, actually. I arrived in January of this year with every intention of spending most of the man my mandate working on the rule of law and anti-corruption. I had worked over the years with then Vice President Biden on this issue, and I fully embraced his notion that the struggle between democracy and autocracy would define his foreign policy and his presidency. President Putin's unprovoked and brutal invasion of Ukraine has made the struggle between democracy and autocracy the defining struggle of our time and given all of us a new sense of urgency. I have visited Ukraine on four occasions in the last 10 years and developed a deep respect for the country and its citizens. Ukrainians are fighting for democracy everywhere, for democracy everywhere with their existential defense of freedom and self-determination in Ukraine. The current crucial challenge for the U.S. and the EU is supporting the Ukrainian people who are risking their lives to preserve their principles, to preserve these principles in the face of ruthless autocrats whose only answer to that challenge is to destroy schools and hospitals and kill innocent civilians. Today we must deliver a strong, united, and forceful response to Russian aggression. This is why the transatlantic partnership is more important than ever and why our coordination on sanctions, export controls, humanitarian assistance, and arms shipments to Ukraine is so crucial. And our efforts are succeeding. By the obje objectives laid out bef before its February 24th full-scale invasion, the Kremlin has already failed. Putin intended to divide the U.S. and its allies and partners, and we are stronger now than ever before. Putin thought he could undermine or overthrow the Ukrainian government, but President Zelensky and the democratic elected government of Ukraine is still standing. Russian forces lost the battle for Kiev and have had to retreat and refocus elsewhere in the country. From the start, the war has been the deep-seated desire of Ukrainians to live in a democracy and a free market. Notwithstanding Russian dis propaganda, the Russian war with Ukraine is not about joining NATO and never has been. It is about accession to the EU. Ukrainians are willing to risk, quote, their lives and their sacred honor, to paraphrase our Declaration of Independence, on behalf of personal liberty, a fight that resonates with all Americans as our founders did in 1776. And it is my privilege as U.S. Ambassador to play a part in this process in Brussels. Every sanction we propose, export control we enacted, every arms delivery we organized, every refugee we helped to save, 
is a part of the struggle of autocracy versus democracy. As I close, I would like to leave you and our leadership here today with one fundamental thought and a related question which I hope we will address today. I came to this job in January with one set of assumptions about the EU and especially its relationship with the United States. But after the cauldron I have lived through in Brussels because of the Ukraine war, I have seen those presumptions fundamentally challenged. I came to Brussels assuming that I would focus on the EU basically as an economic institution. My job was to look at the EU primarily as a forum for discussing common policy issues across the Atlantic on trade and technology, from the privacy shield and the global minimum tax to the rule of law and anti-corruption in Hungary, Poland, and Romania. Security issues were for the most part the responsibility of NATO. That's what I was taught. The, U the EU is for sure an economic union, indeed the preeminent multilateral institution in that space in Europe, and our primary interlocutor on those issues for Europe. What I came to believe, however, in the last 90 days, and I'm anxious to hear your thoughts on this, I have come to believe that a result of what is, but as a result of what has happened in that period, the EU is now an indispensable security institution. While NATO is clearly pre the preeminent transatlantic military institution, once the decision was made, appropriately I might add, to not go quote unquote kinetic in Ukraine, not to send NATO into Ukraine, EU all of a sudden became a primary fora for protecting transatlantic security. While NATO would keep the war from spreading into NATO territory, as President Biden likes to say, not one inch of NATO territory is at, will be at risk, the primary institution for holding Russia accountable for its acts to downgrade its economy and its military capability into the future, to arm the Ukrainians and to deal with the collateral consequences for this war, humanitarian, food prices, and blunting asymmetric activities by the Russians in the Balkans or, in, or disinformation in cyber is the EU, not NATO. That is a revolutionary thought. Not only did we begin at the EU drafting financial sanctions and export controls and then scale them up for the rest of the world, but coordination of arms deliveries by the U.S. and the 27 EU member states to the Ukraine is not through NATO, but through UCOM, or the European Command of the U.S. military, and the European Council, European uh, Commission. In the case of the EU uh, and its member states, it's a 2 billion euro European Union fund that is paying for these arms. It is these sanctions and controls which will hopefully eventually shut down the, Europe, the Russian war machine and cut off the military and the Russian economy from the technology that they are almost completely dependent on. It is those arms that courageous Ukrainians use to win the Battle of Kiev. It is our coordination on refugees, humanitarian aid, securing agriculture for the largest breadbasket in the world that is essentially a security challenge. Let's talk today about how we did that and how we could do it better. And most important, what are the upcoming challenges, security challenges that the EU will have to face? But most importantly, let's discuss how we should think about the EU and NATO in this context, or better yet, rethink that. How do we change the perception of the EU's new security role, and what risks there are in that role, and how do we think about it in the context of NATO's role? These are difficult and not easy questions to answer. So it is my great pleasure to join you today to celebrate an important program, one that recognizes that one of the greatest partnerships in the world is the transatlantic relationship, 
and also I hope to get your advice on how to answer these questions. May your future endeavors ensure not only the strength and endurance of the relationship, but of the democracy and democratic values at its core. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for very insightful uh, thoughts. I, uh, I have to say it's only a few months you are here, but uh, I think you got an intensive <laughs> Um, look at, uh, at the developments in the European Union and the transatlantic relation, and I'm sure that we will have a little bit of time to engage also with the students in exchanging and hopefully share some, some ideas about uh, your questions too. But now let me um, welcome and uh, also apologize for uh, the, the, the delay uh, Ambassador Stavros Lambrinidis that is uh, connected uh, with us from Washington DC. If I I'm uh, not wrong. Um, hi, Stavros. I think, I hope, uh, yeah, once you, you turn on the mic, once you start uh, um, speaking, probably we, you, we managed to see your full screen. Um, I am particularly pleased he accepted our invitation because I, I like this idea of bringing, bridging the transatlantic community together uh, in, this, in this way, uh, having somehow the US view on the European Union and the European Union view on the US uh, in this particular moment. Uh, you have to know that uh, uh, Ambassador Lambrinidis uh, uh, is, uh, uh, has been for me a pillar uh, during my time as a high representative in different roles, and last but not least as uh, the head of the EU delegation in Washington DC, but also previously he covered many uh, other positions, uh, one more important than the other. So uh, without further ado, because I know that uh, Stavros, you have a, a plane to catch uh, uh, in uh, less than half an hour, so I'll give you immediately the floor and looking very much forward to hearing your, your views. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Federica, uh, dear friends. Um, uh, this is a, a College of Europe celebration, uh, but it's also a Madeleine Albright celebration. I had the, uh, the honor to be um, in the uh, National Cathedral uh, during Madeleine's memorial service, and it was not just remarkable in the context of the people who spoke, but also the people who attended. Uh, there was a huge delegation of former foreign ministers from all over the world who were present in that cathedral uh, to celebrate uh, Madeleine's legacy. And it is not, I think, um, accidental uh, that that international recognition came at that particularly important, sad, but important moment. But if you will allow me, Federica, and I know in fact, that you will not appreciate this, given the fact that you are perhaps a little more humble than you should be. Um, you celebrated Madeline as a mentor of yours. And I want to say that given the emphasis that was rightly placed on the fact that she wasn't just a brilliant um, Secretary of State, but also the first uh, woman Secretary of State, um, I have to say that you, Federica, and your leadership of the European Union's external uh, policy um, had been for me and is and for everyone worked for you an absolute inspiration. I am honored to count you as a mentor and as a friend. Uh, and uh, Mark, um, it is so fantastic to have you as the U.S. ambassador in the EU now, um, as a non-diplomatic ambassador, as you said. Maybe that's true. Uh, I'm not a professional diplomat myself. So when Federica decided to appoint me here to the United States, um, I think she was taking a, uh, a, a sort of a risk, and I hope she has not regretted it, to be honest. Um, okay, dear friends. Best choice ever. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so very quickly on, on, on my side. Um, the European Union was created 72 years ago, as you know, um, and it came out of an existential need uh, to turn a labor of hate into a labor of love. Uh, we came out of the Second World War where we killed each other, we came out of the Second World War where we actually committed the biggest human rights violation in history, which was the Holocaust. And we decided as Europeans that never again, ever again, would we allow ourselves to have the desire or the means to uh, perpetuate such destruction and such hatred on each other or anyone else in the world. This was not an economic um, um, uh, you know, union to begin with. It was a deeply political one. And those who do focus on the EU 
uh, on uh, the Cypriot's economic uh, structure, and they should. Uh, the crowning achievement is the single market. Uh, I'm missing the point. They missed the point when they assumed uh, that the euro uh, would not be a currency that would survive because you couldn't, in theory, have monetary union without economic or political, uh, full political union. Uh, and of course, the euro has survived, uh, the second biggest, uh, strongest currency in the world. They missed it in every one of the recent crises that we faced as Europeans, uh, whether it was the financial crisis or uh, the migration crisis or Brexit indeed or uh, COVID. Um, um, and of course, uh, now uh, Russia and Ukraine. Um, Europeans are together and with every crisis, they become even stronger together because we did unite back then to ensure that war would never happen in our borders. Uh, but we also, uh, in subsequent decades, uh, united even more because we understood that a number of world challenges out there, um, from climate change to pandemics uh, to um, uh, the economy and trade, those cannot be handled by any one uh, single European member state on its own. Even the biggest European member states would be very small indeed in the world if they were not united um, uh, voluntarily, if they had not united part of the sovereignty of the EU. So what Russia did was a direct attack to this existential reason, raison d'etre of the European Union. Uh, no one should have been surprised by the tremendous strength and unity that the EU showed. Um, and they shouldn't have been surprised, um, but of course, uh, Pre President Putin appeared to have been. Uh, he was hoping, uh, I am sure he was, that at least one of our 27 member states would not support the massive unprecedented sanctions we have imposed against his regime and his capacity to fundraise for this and other wars. Uh, and he was wrong in that assumption. Uh, he clearly assumed uh, that looking at the US and the, and the EU and perhaps some turbulence in the past few years that we would not be able to unite together to face him, which was the only way to do so effectively in the end of the day. And boy, did he fail on that. Um, the uh, US administration uh, by President Biden and the EU administration, President von der Leyen, President Michel, uh, have worked together uh, since the summit, of course, uh, but certainly since the Russian invasion, uh, in a lockstep way that, that was unprecedented. Um, and he certainly thought that uh, NATO and the collective European architecture that Americans and Europeans put together after the Second World War, uh, you know, a world order based on the rule of law, he certainly hoped that he could, you know, kill that in addition to literally killing Ukrainians on the ground and hoping to extinguish Ukraine from the map. And he has failed in all those things. And it is not by accident that it has, it's because a strong European Union, a united EU together with the US have managed to stop it. So four, maybe five very quick points uh, to elaborate this. Uh, is the European Union an economic superpower? Absolutely. Is it becoming an economic superpower with teeth? Yes. And I think the sanctions showed this. And something that is not often discussed, but is absolutely true, is that when the new administration came in and the EU made a proposal among a few others to establish a so-called Trade and Technology Council, in other words, to turn a negative trade agenda into a positive way to determine the rules of the road for the world economy in the 21st century and to also enrich American and European uh, economies and societies, um, when that was established and took place back in Pittsburgh for the first time in September and just now in France for the second meeting, many of those discussions and the personal relations that developed there were critical in ensuring that when Russia invaded, we would be able to, in lightning speed, Americans and Europeans impose essentially the same sanctions, including a very important sanctions on export controls. They're not discussed that much but they are what will ensure that Russia's economy will not be able to diversify and to modernize in the 21st century. And it is that kind of both political commitment and um, bureaucratic, if you like, uh, working level interaction that made that possible. Now, I mentioned the single market. We are each other's biggest trade and investment partners by far. We are the contributors to U.S. prosperity here in this country where I am honored to serve more than anyone else in the world other than what the U.S. government, any administration does. And the U.S. is the biggest contributor to European prosperity through its investment and trade 
than anything that we as a EU can do. By far, a relationship that exceeds anything else. It didn't happen in spite of the EU, but because of it. The single market and our ability to break down all barriers to trade because we broke down our own borders is what has allowed U.S. companies to invest and to make more profits in Europe than anywhere else by setting shop in any corner of Europe and then being able to trade with 450 of the most prosperous and educated consumers in the world and vice versa for us. We are each other's indispensable economic partner. Second point I'd like to make is for the future. We are talking a lot about China when it comes to the economy, and we should. It is an unfair competitor and a very dangerous one when it comes to that. Uh, but in the end of the day, I have always felt that in order to compete with China, the first thing we have to do is to run faster than China. They're doing what they're doing, good for them or bad for them. We can sit back and complain or try to stop them, but frankly, at the end of the day, our economies are too interconnected, and of course we will try to stop the worst things. But what we have not done enough, and we are beginning to do now, is to invest more in our own economies, our own innovation, running faster. And an area where I see tremendous opportunity for cooperation there is global infrastructure investments. The United States has the Build Back Better World initiative. We have a global gateway initiative. China for years has Belt and Road and has been using it in a very strategic way to be able to exert not just economic but also political influence. Well, Americans and Europeans had to start working together on this and we are today. And that is something that I urge every one of you to follow in the future. Put a check mark next to that. That's going to be quite important to look in the future. Uh, a third thing I want to mention when it comes to the economy and the strength of the European and American economies is Ukrainian reconstruction. Dear friends, it's, you know, the European Union became the superpower that it is today when it comes to the economy because we managed not to regulate but to deregulate more than anyone else in the world. We took 27, 28 with the UK and different laws and regulations um, uh, that different countries had and we trashed them. And in their place, we put together a common set of rules and regulations that allowed us to bring down the borders. That was a very painful process for many member states to go through. They had to change entirely the way that their economy was structured, their laws were structured, but that allowed then the single market to be created with all the benefits. Same thing has to happen in Ukraine. And so we just announced our own proposal to ensure not just that money, and we're talking about hundreds of billions, will come into Ukraine now and in the future to reconstruct the country and to help it, but also that the EU, together with the Ukrainian government, will be able in the driver's seat to ensure that this money does the work that it needs to do to make sure that Ukraine also is able to transform itself in the way that all European member states have. And that is a precursor for, of course, the future uh, uh, European prospect of Ukraine. Uh, second point I want to make is the military point that Mark also raised. Um, indeed, uh, the EU um, has shown its military teeth now with the war in Ukraine. Two billion dollars have been committed by the EU, EU budget, to support our member states in sending lethal military aid to the Ukrainians, which together with the US aid and NATO aid has been uh, determined uh, in the way that the Ukrainians have uh, been able to fight back uh, Putin's, uh, uh, you know, military plans. Um, at the same time, we as Europeans uh, are recognizing that we have to spend better and more together. Today, European member states have no doubt about this, because sometimes the past conversations may have confused this point, are the second biggest military spenders after the United States. But in many instances, this money that a member state spend is inefficiently spent. And we have decided that we're going to stop that. And Federica started this when she was the, uh, the HRVP. Um, and uh, Jose Porel now is continuing this uh, very effectively. Uh, and the whole EU moving into coordinating and cooperating to make sure that we are able to create the military capabilities that are necessary for us as Europeans independent of everyone else to defend when it needs to be with weapons, our strategic interests, but also to strengthen NATO, because there's not a Greek army and a Greek NATO army or a French army and a, Greek, and a French NATO army. It's one army. 
And when our national armies are stronger and more coordinated, NATO is stronger and more coordinated. Third point that I want to make has to do with, uh, with uh, energy and climate and this challenge that is facing the transatlantic relationship and the world. We have decided we're going to decouple from Russia energy. 40% of our gas today comes from Russia, about 30% of our oil comes from Russia, and Russia's aggression has proven uh, to anyone, to everyone, that this cannot continue. We have to decouple, and decouple as fast and as efficiently and as effectively as we can. When President Biden and President von der Leyen recently um, uh, agreed and announced that the U.S. would be supplying 50 BCM of gas out of the 150 that we get today from Russia, one-third, in other words, of it. That was a huge move forward in that direction. Uh, but we, as Europeans, uh, have also determined that our homegrown energy is renewable energy. And we have been investing for decades uh, in that energy. And today, renewable energy in Europe, a homegrown energy, has achieved economies of scale that are unseen anywhere else in the world and uh, is allowing us to very concretely believe that we can, by 2050, be carbon neutral, but also at the same time be at the cutting edge of that technology to be able to give the rest of the world. Why does that matter, the rest of the world? And why we should, as we appreciate and do pursue um, uh, you know, gas and, uh, and other fossil fuel sources as a bridging uh, fuel for the future. Why should Americans and Europeans focus together on a green future for the world? Well, there are many answers to this, but if I just focus on Russia, think about this. We want to stop them from making money out of the oil and gas that they have. And we are certainly stopping them from turning the economy into anything else. But the fact is that then the rest of the world must need their oil and the gas less than they do today. Because if they need it a lot, Russia will try to find eventually alternatives when Europe cuts them off. So making sure that the rest of the world also moves to green, where Americans and Europeans do have the cutting edge of technology and the correct incentives, not profit making, not corrupt, to support the rest of the world, making that happen ensures that Putin loses. That is geostrategic from, for Europe and the US. It is not a nice to have thing. Fourth point, technology cooperation. I mentioned the Tate Trade and Technology Council. Dear friends, there the European Union is running ahead, uh, sometimes from the US as well. Um, you know, the General Data Protection Regulation is a classic example. I was a vice president of the European Parliament when we were first running the seeds of that regulation, talking about privacy, um, in, in ways that were seen as exotic. You know, I had, I had a major CEO of a U.S., uh, you know, big, uh, you know, um, uh, social platform talk to me at the time, um, and I talked to him about privacy and the importance of making sure that, you know, uh, the, the police uh, or private or companies or others do not have, you know, unfettered access to our data. And, and his answer to me was at the time, listen, I believe this, what's your problem? Do you, you know, are, are you a terrorist? I said, no. Are you a criminal? No. Then what are you afraid of? If you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. You know, governments want that data in order just you know, to catch terrorists or criminals. And I, I thought about this for a second, and then I said, you know what? If you have nothing to hide, you don't have a life. <laughs> Get a life. We all have, you know, tens of things, absolute legal things, very legitimate things that, that we actually want to hide. If you have nothing to hide, tell me who you voted for in the last elections. I know it's you know, a secret ballot, but who cares? Just go ahead and tell me. Or give me your credit card number for that matter. I mean, it is a debate that has shifted dramatically on this side of the pond as well. And now there are so many members of Congress or even states, California is an example, that are very much following the, the EU example here. And I think that it is in the struggle uh, that Mark mentioned between democracy and autocracy, a fundamental, again, existential interest for us, Americans and Europeans, to ensure that we set the rules of the road and that we ourselves are the best examples of making sure that all these platforms that are out there use our data in a way that uh, does not violate our privacy and also does not spread uh, the hatred and the violence that has been so prevalent uh, in um, recent iterations, um, you know, of our lives here, and that, uh, you know, uh, Putin and others have tried to use also 
to undermine our, our democracies. Um, and finally, when it comes to the rest of the world, I always make this point when it comes to Russia's invasion. We are not the West fighting Russia here. We are the West and the East and the North and the South fighting for Ukraine. We are fighting for the right of people to serve to determine their lives, to their right to freedom within secure borders. We are fighting for what the UN Charter, East and West, North and South, provides for. So yes, indeed, this is a potent effort to kill the sovereignty and the democracy of Ukraine, and to also, in that same effort, kill the will and the ability of the West, America, Europe, and others, to fight him uh, or other countries that are supporting him today. Of course, that is the case. But we need to build coalitions around the world. And those coalitions are not always easy. And we do have histories ourselves, Europeans and Americans, that do not always resonate nicely in different parts of the world. We have to be very intelligent as we approach this effort. And this is not a guns effort. This is a diplomacy effort. And if we do this right, I have no fear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stavros. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, let me say, um, what a great team. And I say team because uh, if I can share a little bit of uh, my experience in my previous job, I can tell you that when uh, the US ambassador to the EU and the EU ambassador to the US uh, manage to work together and their teams, it means that any summit you have, any ministerial, any council you have on any sector of policy, uh, that is the floor is set for success rather than for problems. <laughs> and I think that here we have a great um, synergy uh, around uh, your table. That is also our table. And uh, it was a pleasure to listen to both of you. Stavros, do you have time for a little bit of an exchange? Five, ten minutes? Yeah. Not more? Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll open the floor. So if you have questions or comments, uh, uh, just raise your hands. Uh, I would say that we have the time probably to take one or two, and I would take them together. Let me, while you, you, you reflect and you think, let me uh, just underline two points, uh, one, um, one each, uh, that I share very much. Uh, one is this, uh, this uh, reflection um, that you made, Ambassador, about uh, uh, the difference between being a military player and being a security player. And I think that we are focusing on that now much more than in the past, knowing that we're starting to realize well that the military is always part of the security, uh, but it's never the only part of a security um, effort, especially in these times. And that uh, while NATO is by definition a military alliance, uh, the European Union is a security provider that is increasing its military stand, but also having different instruments uh, at its disposal. And I have to say, yes, I was very proud when I saw that the European Peace Facility was used to, the, to support the delivery of arms, because uh, I remember when we established it, and, uh, uh, well, it was not uh, the purpose uh, we thought of at that moment, but I think it's proving to be very efficient, uh, not to, to mention the use of sanctions and the financial, um, the financial instruments uh, that are part of the security architecture that the European Union can contribute to build. And also, I would like to underline one point that Stavros mentioned at the very, at the very end of his intervention uh, that I share very much. Um, I was making exactly the same point a couple of days ago, uh, that I think we have a, a common interest in, in avoiding the narrative of the West versus uh, because indeed it is, and it should be, the international community versus the breach of international law. And I think that this can help building coalitions across the world, or at least unveiling some of the alibi that are built around the world not to align fully. Having said that, uh, let me open the floor for one or two questions or comments, if there are any. You see how the students get exhausted at the end of the academic year. <laughs> no? I'm 
surprised. Well, it's the, it's the beginning of the day for me, almost the beginning of the right. day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yesterday I was doing a Young Leaders Forum with uh, uh, ASEAN, uh, so it, it was mm, it was a late morning for me, it was uh, evening for them, and uh, they were definitely, yeah. definitely tired. Okay, so if there's no intervention, not only from students, but also from alumni. Yes, we have one there, because we have here also alumni and uh, former students that are welcome also to join. Please, if you can maybe introduce yourself and then put yes, your question or so comment. Yes, so I'm currently MATA student uh, here at the college in Bruges. Uh, I'm Sami, I'm French. Um, thank you for your inter intervention. My question would be for Mr. Ambassador, uh, US Ambassador to the EU. Um, so you made this distinction between security and military actor, but do you think the EU could be a military actor? Well, it could be. It already is, in a sense, because, uh, you, all the, as I said in my statement, uh, almost all the military equipment that's getting into Ukraine now is coming through the European Union, through the Peace Fund, the reimbursement process, in cooperation with the, with the UCOM, the European. So it's already performing military functions, but it's its real value added is in this broader definition of security, which is to use the power of our, our, of our markets to plant a purely military reaction by the Russians. And it's the, we, it's the sanctions and the export controls uh, and also dealing with the collateral consequences uh, of this war everything from food security to humanitarian assistance, which is also security because it's, pr it's protecting the integrity of our borders and Ukraine's borders, which is the essence of what security is about. So yes, it's primarily a security function as the 21st century to define it, not a military function. And as we saw in, in Ukraine, I think one of the, the revolutionary moments for our military strategies is to face the fact that, you know, NATO, which is built around a lot of tanks, uh, you know, the Russian tanks were not particularly effective. So uh, even military doctrine is challenged by this. Um, I think Stavros identified the central problem that, or one of the central problems that the European Union has when it performs military functions is that it, there is no uniformity. I mean, you know, there are probably 20 different kinds of tanks being built in Europe right now. Uh, that's a problem. And to the extent they're providing military equipment uh, into the future, uh, they're going to have to, you know, they have to raise their game, as we say in the United States. And that's a big challenge for the EU. But, it, but they'll they'll have to do it. I'll make one last point. I was thinking of this uh, as the rector was speaking. You know, as you think about the peace process, knock on wood, we get there. The central and most vexing issue for the Ukrainians is security guarantees. We can't expect Zelensky to sign another Budapest memorandum. That didn't work out too well for them. So how are you going to protect the borders of Ukraine, especially from the Russians, if there's no Article 5, which there may well not be, and there's no other security guarantee? How are you going to do it? It's going to be with what we are colloquially calling security assurances. And what are those assurances? It's going to be more of the same of what the EU has been doing. It's going to be providing arms, it's going to be training their military, but more important, it's going to be helping them build a vibrant democracy and a free market. And as Stavros said, it's also going to be about building institutions that are independent and enforce the rule of law, or you're never going to attract the investment necessary to rebuild that country. There isn't enough public money available through the IMF or the United States or the EU to do this. It's going to have to be private investment. Those are huge challenges, and the only institution I know in the world that knows how to do that is the European Union. Federica, can I, can I jump in quickly on this? Sure, absolutely. And can I add a question to this so that you also uh, mm -hmm. try to answer to that too? Uh, I re perfectly remember that when we started uh, to, uh, to, to, to build, actually, uh, for real, the European Union defense, uh, 2016, 2017, um, there was a lot of enthusiasm in Europe, but it was also a little bit of uh, skepticism, if I be di more diplomatic than, than um, how Madeleine would have been, a little bit of skepticism on the US side uh, that this would have endangered the transatlantic community, NATO, that would have created competition. Do you have the impression, both um, in sitting in DC or, or representing the US here, 
that this perception of, um, of skepticism about the European Union defense buildup uh, now has, uh, has changed uh, in the United States or across the Atlantic? As, uh, is this fading away? So I, I would say, uh, yes, the, the perception has dramatically changed. Um, but there still is um, a very close follow-up on the part of the U.S. administration of what it is that we are doing in the context of assuring that it is complementary to NATO, uh, which both we and the U.S. consider to be the fundamental security umbrella for, for, for uh, the whole of Europe. Um, it, it, it's a very, very good thing that for the first time, after, remember, Federica, how many years we were trying to get this done, uh, for the first time, uh, now we have a dedicated EU-US uh, security and defense dialogue in place. Um, and the first meeting took, took place uh, back in Brussels uh, a month ago. Um, but there is an absolute recognition that the EU needs to be able to be more efficient in its spending uh, and, uh, and to develop the military capabilities, uh, its own military capabilities as well, uh, that are NATO uh, compatible. Uh, but what I wanted to say also, uh, fully agreeing with Mark, is that indeed it is a mistake to be thinking about defense only narrowly, uh, how many guns you have. And the EU has always been in that context, in the context of trying to build a resilient societies uh, that ensure, in the end of the day, uh, that, um, you know, violence, uh, you know, and authoritarianism uh, and human rights violations do not take hold. Uh, we have been in the forefront of development aid um, around the world, um, uh, you know, over the decades. And when I was running the human rights uh, foreign policy for the EU under, under Federica, um, I remember visiting a number of countries around the world uh, at the time, mid 2010s, uh, terrorism, as you remember, was uh, big time on the rise, uh, raising human rights issues. And many governments who violated rights, you know, eventually would just turn to me and say, Mr. Lambrinidis, why are you poisoning the well of our relationship here? Uh, we you know we are fighting terrorism, uh, terrorists, and you are talking about you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, protecting people who are protesting against what we're doing, uh, or th pr protesting against throwing people in jail who disagree with us. We have this bigger goal, and you know, so why are you doing this? And I would answer that question with another question. I would tell them, okay, you tell me, what's so scary about smart girls? I mean, why did Boko Haram in Nigeria, you know, a big terrorist organization? Uh, back in 2014, why did it abduct, uh, you know, 300 girls from school as opposed to bombing one more army barracks that they're good at, right? And why, why, why did terrorists in Pakistan uh, plant a bullet in Malala Yousafzai's head, um, you know, when she was advocating for girls' education? You know, in, in Iraq, why did ISIS abduct and forcefully marry and even kill, you know, hundreds of Yazidi girls? Uh, and today in Afghanistan, why are the Taliban trying so hard to keep girls out of school? And the answer to me to that question was very, very clear. Uh, you know, uh, smart girls become educated women, and educated women uh, turn, uh, you know, change entirely the balance of power in any society. And the last thing that terrorists want uh, is empowered societies. They want societies with big black holes of power that they can fill in with their hatred and with their violence. So you want to fight terrorists? Educate girls and boys, but educate girls. Look at what terrorists signal with every attack that they hate the most. They hate girls' education. They hate freedom of religion. They hate freedom of, uh, of speech. Uh, you know, they hate independent, strong institutions because they want to govern through violence. And all these are human rights. So don't tell me that human rights is soft foreign policy. It is irrelevant and only guns matter. It is hardcore foreign policy. And I think that this is what Europe has excelled in. Uh, I perfectly remember that uh, uh, you suggested me at the time uh, a very, I think, a very smart definition uh, that applies to this, and that is that the European Union is investing in sustainable security that includes yeah. human rights, rule of law, and democracy. And I thought this was really a brilliant uh, formula to, to that includes indeed the non-military aspect, the non so-called hard power uh, aspects in something that is indeed hard court security in itself. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, and then if there is another one, uh, I don't know if we have also, Michelle, maybe you have uh, an idea whether we have also questions online. Otherwise, I think we can. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we, we take maybe two together. 
uh, one here and one online, and then we give you the floor so that we then move on. Okay, um, well, thank you both for your inspiring interventions. I'm Cecilia, I'm French and Guatemalan, a current MATA student. Um, I'd like to get your perspectives on, so the transatlantic relation is probably stronger than ever, as we usually say, but what are some issues that we're missing? What can we do to strengthen it even more? What can we focus on together? Thank you. Thank you. Shall we get the Thank one online? Yeah. Yes. I have, yeah, it's working. So we have a question from Luc Etienne Fouqueux, who is also a MATA student who is uh, uh, in Fletcher now. So Russia apparently influenced the election campaigns of both sides of the Atlantic, for instance, by supporting Mr. Trump or Mrs. Le Pen. How can the transatlantic partners protect themselves domestically? So if you want me, I can mark with apologies because I have to fly to North Carolina and South Carolina. Um, so I, I think I tried in my intervention to answer the first question uh, and I highlighted a few things that, that we have to do. Uh, in the second question, uh, we are working very hard right now in Europe with the uh, Digital uh, Services Act, as we call it, uh, and also working with many people here in the US Congress uh, to try to address the very, very difficult topic of ensuring uh, the vibrant freedom of speech that we have in our societies, while at the same time making sure that, that uh, big social platforms are not uh, being used or manipulated, um, including through algorithms that the platforms themselves set uh, to spread uh, division and hatred uh, in ways that are illegal. In other words, to sp spread speech that is illegal. This is, a, a, this is, in some instances, a difficult discussion because in the US very often the First Amendment um, is, uh, is being raised as a, um, uh, as an impediment to having um, uh, too many controls. But what we're doing is also working with, uh, with companies themselves, uh, trying to have um, voluntary codes of conduct, but very strong and enforceable ones. And now with the Digital Services Act, we also are trying to make sure that consumers, um, uh, you know, in the digital marketplace, but also citizens in the political digital marketplace uh, have these protections in place. What is illegal? offline should be legal offline, uh, online. Um, and uh, this is a difficult balance, uh, but we have to find it because the internet, artificial intelligence, all those things are going to be taking over our lives more and more. And that indeed could be a fantastic thing. And there's so many examples to describe of how our lives will become better because of it, but it could also be in some areas a very, very dangerous thing. And, um, you know, um, so, Deep discussions ongoing, and that's certainly an area for future cooperation between Americans and Europeans. Thank you, Stavros. Uh, I guess that you will need to go while we continue. So thank you for joining us, uh, uh, and see you soon, hopefully also in presence. You're always welcome to join us in Bruges or in Natalin. Uh, Mark, oh, so, sorry, it came yeah. out of my heart. I'm Mr. Ambassador. <laughs> no, please, call me Mark. Uh, most people call me Mark. Uh, I'm going to respond first to something Stavros said in the last answer and then pick up on these, the next two points. While I agree with Stavros that things have gotten better in terms of the dialogue and because of the dialogue, I do not think we're moving fast enough in this space in terms of U.S., EU, EU, NATO dialogue over the next building the security structures for the 21st century. We are literally, as to, to paraphrase the words of a famous former Secretary of State, um, we are present at the creation of a new structure, but we've got to get to work building it faster and at higher levels within the U.S. government. I don't, you know, I'm being, I'm showing my inner Madeleine Albright here and saying things I probably shouldn't say as a U.S. ambassador, but I think that dialogue needs to be faster, more frequent, and at a higher level, uh, and on both sides. Uh, and we have to, both within the EU, within NATO, and within the U.S. government, give up some of our 1990s presumptions about what security is and how to deal with it. We are in a war which is not by any means over, and the peace process is going to be very vexing and difficult. We have to resolve uh, our understandings between all of these institutions about what their proper role is and how do they proceed. That's number one. Uh, on the last two points, um, you know, 
how could we be more effective in the, in the transatlantic relationship above and beyond uh, what we're doing already? You know, here's a striking thing that's very bothersome to me, and by the way, my friends at the EU keep reminding me of this, but I hear it from other people as well. You know, 70% of the world does not agree with what we're doing in Ukraine, at least as their representatives vote in the United Nations, okay? Within the West, quote unquote West, that is the EU and I guess the G7, there's consensus. But most of the world is either indifferent or cynical about what we're doing. You know, it's a bunch of former colonial powers. I'm talking primarily now about the third world. And I think a lot of that's our fault. By the way, there's nobody better in engaging the third world, in particular Africa, than the EU. We're particularly not good about it in the United States. And that's a very frustrating thing to me. And we need to focus on this because if we can't further isolate Russia and to a certain extent China in the third world, we are going to fail. And that is a big problem for us. And I think it's one reason why food security, for example, is so important. They're going to pay a very dear price in the third world because of food security and energy security. Uh, and they're going to, because we are, we're only getting a little better at the public diplomacy of this, they're going to blame us. And that's not going to be good. On the DSA, I'm, I'm sorry Stavros had to get off because it's a point that I often make on the DSA, digital security reg regulation, which is the European Union regulation of the platform. So Facebook, for example, and Twitter. I admire what the EU did with the DSA. I don't agree with all of it, but they're way ahead of us. And by the way, my prediction is we may never legislate anything in the United States. But those rules are going to apply to our platforms. Most tech companies are still, they're only beginning to dawn on them that because maybe nothing happened in the Congress, nothing's going to happen. Not true, okay? Facebook and Twitter are going to be regulated from Brussels, not from Washington. Uh, and unless we can coordinate that regulation, and part of this is the Biden administration's fault because we don't have a, a yet enacted, and we can't get anything through Congress yet, and the, the regulators themselves have not done enough, we don't have different regulatory schemes that we can drive together through the TTC or anything else. That's a big problem for us because most Americans are gonna be regulated by the European Union like they are already in the privacy regime. And that's why we work so hard to settle the differences on privacy, which I think we have. But we have not settled our differences on the issue that Stavros talked about, which is how to regulate these platforms so that they're not abused by, by bad actors, whether they're Russians or right-wing nationalists or chauvinists or whoever. That's a big problem for us, and we need to figure out a way to resolve that problem. I see that as a big challenge for me going forward, to convince the Europeans that they, to convince uh, the people in the European Commission that they have to work with us on the implementation of their statute. Thank you. Um, I think this was a fascinating exchange and uh, very interesting for me, uh, for sure. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the continuation of this uh, dialogue uh, and, uh, um, and this common work. Uh, I think that uh, now it is the moment uh, for our students uh, to take the floor. Uh, so, Michelle, uh, shall you introduce them? And let me uh, thank, uh, once again, um, our ambassadors uh, for uh, not only the very insightful speeches, but also the availability to interact and to answer to the questions. Thank you so much for this. And Okay, so I think it's time we've heard from the heart and soul of the MATA program, which is our students. So we're going to hear first from Maria Balash Sola, who is the College of Europe student representative, and then afterwards we'll hear from Benjamin Ramos, who is the Fletcher student representative, and he's visiting us online. So, Maria? Mr. Ambassador Gintenstein, Madame Rector Mogherini, Madame Vice Rector Osnia Katameka, Professor Chang, and all of our colleagues here in Bruges and around the world. It is an honor for me to speak on behalf of the MATA students who spent the first year of the program at the College of Europe. 
For us, the MATA program means an incredible opportunity to move from knowledge to action. The eight of us on this side of the Atlantic feel deeply European and transatlantic and strongly believe in the combination of both of these identities. The creation of the EU cannot be understood without the support of the US, but nor can the US continue to defend our rules-based international order without the support of a strong European Union. And we believe there is no better time to be a student of the MATA program than today, when we're witnessing the most remarkable example of transatlantic cooperation in the coordinated response to the outrageous Russian invasion of Ukraine. Experience tells us we cannot take the partnership for granted, but with the help of professors, speakers, and colleagues from, bo from both the College of Europe and the Fletcher School, we are prepared to be up for the task. We feel very lucky to make up the fifth promotion of the MATA program, named after Amelia Earhart. She's an American aviation pioneer, women's rights activist, an author who's best known for being the first female aviator to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. Although we also belong to the Vogel Polsky promotion here at the College of Europe, our MATA identity is very dear to us. And despite spending most of our time with our colleagues from across the different departments, we still consider our MATA colleagues our closest friends. Some of the memories we most cherish include our Thanksgiving lunch, our coffee breaks with Professor Chang, and her study trip to Brussels visiting the US mission, the Canada mission, the EAS, and the American Chamber of Commerce. And now, allow me to give the floor to Ben, who will speak on behalf of the Fletcher Starters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. I'm honored to represent the Monta students attending the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. From early mornings in Professor Shadda's class to incorporating our studies in the different courses that we've been able to take here at Fletcher, this year has been full of enriching experiences. As the transatlantic relationship is once again a foreign policy priority, we are committed to doing our, our part here in the United States to help rebuild and strengthen the alliance. We would like to take this opportunity to thank our former promotions who paved the way for us in this experience and the many transatlantic leaders who inspire all of us, especially former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, who we celebrate today. We are inspired by her legacy and are motivated to continue it. The future of the transatlantic alliance and the challenges that lie ahead require leaders of all kinds. We look forward to a MATA program that continues to reflect the diverse, dynamic nature of the alliance and the people that comprise it. This program has become an important part of both the Fletcher School and the College of Europe communities, and will alumni on both sides of the Atlantic and around the world is an increasingly visible part of the day-to-day -day operations that drive the Alliance. With the knowledge that the MATA program has given us in and out of the classroom, all of us are prepared to do our part in working towards strengthening democracy and building a better future for all of those on both sides of the Atlantic and around the world. Maria and I are honored to be the student representatives for the College of Europe and the Fletcher for the Amelia Earhart promotion. Thank you very much to everyone there in Bruges and for all of those tuning online today. Special shout out to my mom for tuning in as well. Thank you also to the speakers and all of those who have made this event possible. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. I just wanted to say one thing and ask each of you a question. First of all, I, I know you have career amb ambitions and I'm very curious for each of you to give me just 20 seconds on where you think you'll be in five years. What do you want to be doing in five years with this degree, okay? But I want to tell you a story quickly because for the, uh, the young man at the Fletcher School, 
Uh, I don't think he was in this program, but Bjorn Siebert. I don't know who, anybody here know who Bjorn Siebert is? Bjorn Siebert is the chef de cabinet of Vandale Ursula van der Leyen. I spend, as Libby knows, my wife, probably an hour a week on the telephone with this man. He is probably, there's no more important, there are many interlocutors I have, but I talk to Bjorn Siebert a lot. And if you want to know how we got the privacy shield done or how we created the export controls, which I agree with uh, Stavros's point, probably the most fundamental thing we did, as well as the financial sanction, the primary interlocutor with most of the decision makers in the Biden administration, not just me, is with Bjorn Siebert. He is a graduate of the Tufts School of Diplomacy. Uh, and um, so he did a lot with his degree, and I, he didn't have, didn't have this particular degree, but I am interested if you could each give me just 20 seconds on where you think you'll be. What, what are you gonna do with this degree? Where are you gonna be in five years? For me, I would like to be in the yeah, microphone, microphone, microphone is coming. Yeah. Hello, yes. So for me, um, I hope uh, this uh, transatlantic master would allow me to create a, um, a career in the EU institutions, either in the headquarters in Brussels or in the delegations. Well, that'd be a great place to be. Uh, by the way, I just finished a transatlantic dialogue, you know, one of these European Parliament, Radek Sikorsky runs it on the European side and Congressman Jim Costa on the other side. We just did, we spent like a whole day. The best speakers, I'm telling you, I learned a lot from these speakers. There were five of them on each issue area were employees of the European Commission. They're just so impressive. It's, it's an elite core. Mm -hmm. You have the right credentials to get there, so good luck. It's a great place to work. And most likely, mm -hmm. most of them are coming from here. Is that right? Oh, well, that's yes. great. Yeah. And, and Ben? Is Ben? Yeah. Yes. Uh, where will you be in five years? So in five years, I hope to be using my degree to pursue a career in maritime affairs. I'm really interested in maritime issues and promoting maritime policy through public diplomacy, legislative affairs, and the like. So a little more narrow, but using my transatlantic experience in this field, for sure. By the way, just as an anecdote to that, uh, responding to that, I was on the phone, I won't say who it was with, but it was one of the top CEOs of one of the top tech companies in the world. <laughs> And it, it had dawned on me as I talked to this man, he's still, and this is unfortunately true with many tech companies, is just beginning to realize that the center of action, as I said before, is in Brussels. Because re Brussels is a regulatory superpower and somebody like you who could go into one of these companies and explain that to them would not only help the company, but it would help uh, the transatlantic relationship as much as anything I can imagine. Anyhow, just a thought. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think you're ready to become the EU ambassador to Washington, D.C. <laughs> After only a few months. But thanks also to the students for having shared uh, their ideas and also their hopes and dreams. Michelle, back to you. Yes, thank you very much, Ben and Maria. Now, of course, a celebration of Mato would not be complete without hearing from the Fletcher School. Unfortunately, Dean Rachel Kite is unable to join us in person today, so she sends her greetings and a brief message to Mata via video. Good afternoon, friends, colleagues, graduates, and guests. My name is Rachel Kite, Dean of the Fletcher School at Tufts University. It's my pleasure to extend congratulations from this side of the pond to our Master of Arts in Transatlantic Affairs graduating class of 2022, and to our valued partner, the College of Europe, as we celebrate the fifth anniversary of our joint programme. I'd like to extend my heartfelt thanks to Rector Mogherini for hosting today's event, and I'm also grateful to the US Ambassador to the EU, His Excellency Mark Gitkenstein, and the EU Ambassador to the US, His Excellency Stavros Lamarinidis, for their participation today. The matter was first conceptualized as a way to train the next generation of international leaders who would further a strategic, cooperative Euro-Atlantic alliance in pursuit of shared solutions to critical issues. We are proud that the programme is anchored by Fletcher Professor John Shattuck's course on US-EU relations in the 21st century. Professor Shattuck, of course, spent time himself at the College of Europe as a Fulbright Fellow. 
Our programme has turned out five years of outstanding leaders who have put our training into practice, serving not only in government, but in international organisations, regional organisations, industry and civil society. I want to say a few words about one of the greatest transatlantic figures of the post-Cold War era, someone who inspired me and countless other women in international affairs. The diminutive but mighty Madeleine Albright. She never forgot and was committed to never again. She lived her principles, including mentoring and sponsoring a generation of women leaders. As a European with a British passport, living on the other side of the ocean, and who started my career in the 1980s, working on both sides of an iron curtain in the pursuit of the cooperation laid out in the Helsinki Final Act, and someone who has dedicated my life to sustainability as a prerequisite for peace, she was one of my heroes. We would all do well to study her example. Employers of our MATA graduates speak of the value our students bring, most notably their multi-perspective analysis, something we at Fletcher attribute to their time spent on each side of the Atlantic and a signature element of a Fletcher education. Today, transatlantic cooperation is at perhaps the most delicate point in my lifetime for sure. We're living in a time of polycrisis, Today's celebration takes place against the backdrop of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, whose impact ripples to every corner of the world, a world already struggling to cooperate in response to four famines from Yemen to the Horn, extreme weather events imperiling lives and economic growth, rising inequality with and between countries and global supply chain disruption and a global pandemic. The war is ushering in an era of food, energy and inflationary impacts that will test the international system and test the transatlantic alliance. We, Fletcher and the College of Europe, take pride in this programme we have built together. It was built for this moment. Finally, to this year's graduates, you are about to become members of a powerful and vibrant global network of Fletcher alumni make use of it and aim to become a robust participant in it yourself. We look forward to welcoming you back to Medford and to meeting up with you wherever you are and whatever you are doing around this world. Congratulations from the Fletcher community here. Enjoy today's celebration and remain committed to the world that this transatlantic alliance is needed for and will need to build. Thank you. Okay. It's now my pleasure to welcome Professor Simon Schunz, who's going to announce the student prizes for the Lafayette promotion. Indeed, yes. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, dear ambassadors, dear rector, dear vice rector, dear mayor, dear colleagues, um, dear Mata alumni, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, this is the last agenda point. It's an important one. It gives me great pleasure as a former academic coordinator of MATA to be here today and um, to celebrate with you, seeing so many familiar faces here and online. Uh, but it gives me an even greater pleasure to be able to discern a couple of theses and best student prizes for the Lafayette promotion. The Lafayette promotion started in 2019 and was a promotion that was most hit by the um, COVID-19 crisis in March 2020, which is why uh, some of those students had to change their plans. We're asking of them in the MATA program quite a bit of transatlantic mobility. Uh, and this mobility came uh, under pressure because uh, during COVID times, of course, um, they couldn't travel, they couldn't pursue their uh, time uh, in the US, their plans in the US, they couldn't uh, go for in-person teaching to Fletcher. They couldn't go uh, for in-person internships. So some of them took a leave of absence of one or two semesters. And that is why um, they graduated now, um, last week at the Fletcher School. Congratulations uh, to them also from, from my side for this. And that is why we thought it would be a very good moment now today to actually um, discern uh, these two prizes uh, to them and on the occasion of this wonderful 
celebration and on the occasion of seeing uh, and being here together as a community of MATA um, alumni and students. And I would like to begin by uh, announcing the winner of the best, um, st well, the best student of the Lafayette promotion. So um, the winner of this uh, particular award. And um, if my information is right, I have my uh, folder here. Um, it's Jonathan Misk. So um, Jonathan, uh, I heard that Jonathan is following us online. Uh, and uh, I hope you can hear us, see us. Sincere congratulations, Jonathan. <laughs> And um, best wishes uh, from Bruges. I think he's uh, in the US listening to us. Um, secondly, and I'm replacing here my colleague, Professor Westlake, who unfortunately had to uh, excuse himself. Um, I would now like to announce the best thesis prize. And here I think it's important to recall a bit the history of this prize. It's the Jan Olaf Haus Otter Prize. Um, it's a memorial prize. Jan Olaf Haus Otter was an alumnus of the College of Europe. He studied here in the Bertha von Suttner promotion 2002-2003. Uh, and he also studied at the Fletcher School. So in a way, he was a precursor for the MATA uh, program. And um, colleagues from his promotion, 2003-2000, um, uh, well, graduating in 2003, um, created this prize uh, in his honor. And we are now giving it out uh, for the third time um, to uh, a student. And um, I think uh, it's, a great, um, it's a great pleasure to um, be able to do that, to commemorate his memory, because um, Jan Olaf Haus Otter, unfortunately, um, was uh, when he was on duty for the United, Station, United Nations in Haiti in 2010, unfortunately, was there when a natural disaster hit, an earthquake, uh, as you may recall, and uh, it took uh, his life. Um, and uh, I think this is a, a wonderful way to also remember him. I know that the colleagues at the Fletcher School still remember him. Uh, Professor Westlake um, is, uh, was his advisor here, so he remembers him. And, and through this prize, Jan Olaf Hausotter Prize, um, for the best thesis in transatlantic affairs written by a MATA student, I think we're also uh, collectively thinking of him uh, today. Um, I would like to um, announce now the winner of um, this prize for the Lafayette class. The thesis um, that wins the prize has dealt with a very topical issue, and that is um, the issue of hybrid threats. Uh, its full title is Deterrence, Diplomacy, and Domestic Resilience, a Comprehensive uh, US Grant Strategy for Countering Hybrid Threats. Um, it was written under the supervision of my colleague, Professor Hannah Smith, here at the college, uh, and uh, of um, uh, Professor Monica Toft at Fletcher, because we've heard earlier these theses are uh, co-supervised. And um, the name of that student uh, is also uh, Jonathan uh, Misk. So he's, a, he's not here, but a double winner. So once again, uh, congratulations, uh, Jonathan. And with this, um, Michelle, thank you. Thank you very much, Simon, and congratulations to Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Misk. So I'd like to, in closing, thank everybody who spoke today. We greatly appreciate your insights as well as your support of the MATA program. I would also like to thank my colleagues here at the college who made this event today possible, including my MATA team and our colleagues in catering facilities and in particular in communications and Angelo and Neil's team. So thank you very much to all of you. And finally, I would like to thank our colleagues in ICT, our unsung heroes, without whom a transatlantic event, let alone a transatlantic program, would not be possible. So thank you very much, not only for your work today, but for the work that you do in support of MATA. Thank you. And while we celebrate MATA's first five years today, we also look forward to the future. We look forward to welcoming MATA's first Fulbright NATO scholar, Professor Andrea Cameron, next spring. We look forward to welcoming students from the incoming promotion to Bruges, Natalin, and Medford this fall. And I'm pleased to announce the patron of the incoming promotion. The class of 2024 is a Madeleine Albright promotion. Thank you very much for coming, and I invite everyone to join us for a reception downstairs.